When you usually hear Visceral Games discuss, their Dead Space series is the number one set of games that is brought up. And while that is an excellent survival horror series, Visceral is responsible for several great adaptations of licensed properties when they were known as EA Redwood Shores. They were responsible for making games based on the Godfather films, along with making great games based on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Before all of that, they had the keys to the 007 franchise. During the PS2 generation, this studio was knocking it out of the park with quality games based on licensed properties. In each situation, they showed how they respected the property and delivered quality titles to the player. And all of these games fit into different genres, from a turn-based RPG to third-person shooters, action games, and first-person shooters. Redwood Shore's first project based on the Bond franchise was originally going to be an adaptation of the film The World Is Not Enough on the PS2. But through the development of that title, it turned into a completely original Bond adventure. Join me as we take a look back at Agent Under Fire. Towards the end of the PS1 generation, EA planned on publishing four versions of games based on the World Is Not Enough film. At the time, EA wanted to have an exclusive version of the game made on each of the major platforms at the time, along with a version for the PC and the upcoming PS2. The plan was to create versions of the game that were curated for the platform that they were going to be released on. As a result, a different developer was in charge of each different version. Eurocom was responsible for the N64 version, which planned on building off the foundation laid by Goldeneye. Black Ops Entertainment had the experience with making Tomorrow Never Dies for the PS1, so they led the development of that version. EA Redwood Shores was going to be responsible for the PS2 and PC version. This was going to make this the first Bond game for the PS2. Early on in development, the studio knew that they wanted this game to be presented from the first person perspective. They wanted the player to see the world through Bond's eyes. The goal was to provide an intense Bond experience that captured the different action aspects of the character. Shooting was going to be the focus while also providing interesting objectives along with options for stealth. Even this early on, the studio wanted to include many different situations for action like boating, skiing, along with exciting locations. The developers wanted to provide a range of experiences throughout the game. This would include opportunities for many different gadgets as well. Through the course of development, the game was slowly morphing into a game that was more of an original adventure rather than a game based on the World Is Not Enough film. At this time in development, Redwood Shores met with EA management and it was agreed that this game would go in a new direction that would not be tied down or connected to the world is not enough. Instead, this game for the PS2 was going to be a completely original Bond game that captured the spirit and quality of the films. This allowed the developers even more freedom in how they approached the game since they were not tied down to a specific film. The team wanted to make a complete Bond experience through an original story with exotic locations, dangerous weapons, gadgets, and fast cars. The game writers worked with MGM to craft the story. By tackling the different levels, there was going to be gameplay based on driving and first-person shooting. It was important for the developers to provide that expected Bond variety within the first-person levels with options for gadgets and stealth. To ensure that the driving levels had solid control and execution, these levels were made by the same team responsible for the Need for Speed series. This way, these levels would have the appropriate feel and polish to them. Redwood Shores aimed to provide a lot of replay value to the player, including the inclusion of multiplayer along with unlocks that the player could earn through the campaign. These would come in the form of new items and perks for the campaign, along with unlocks for the multiplayer. One interesting part about the game is that once it officially switched into being an original Bond game and not one based on a specific movie, the developers had envisioned Roger Moore in the role of Bond for their game and wanted to have him reprise his role for it. This sadly did not happen, but you can feel the Moore era Bond throughout the entire experience. Along with this, John Cleese originally provided his likeness and voice 
voice to the game, but due to copyright reasons, Cleese was replaced and dubbed by another actor. Agent Under Fire has an interesting development. Since it started out as a next-gen version of The World Is Not Enough, and then transitioned into a completely original game. The idea of having one of the earlier Bonds return back to the role for this game was an exciting one. And while it did not work out for Agent Under Fire, a few years later, the studio would get their chance at bringing the original Bond to the hands of the players. After Agent Under Fire transitioned into a completely original game, it provided the team with the freedom that they wanted to create something from the ground up and original, rather than being tied down by a film. In November 2001, Agent Under Fire was released to the world. Agent Under Fire provides solid first-person shooting with lots of options for variety within the gameplay. The FPS levels are either focused on all-out action, some stealth, along with options for a mix of the two. The action is generally exciting and very much on par with a Bond film. Then there are a nice mix of driving and rail shooting stages to provide even more variety to the brisk campaign. Both of these distractions provided thrilling in-your-face action. Agent Under Fire is a short and sweet ride that has a solid introduction with a quality campaign. When it comes to the shooting, the gameplay still holds up pretty well. Agent Under Fire primarily relies on an auto-aim system. This mostly gets the job done at targeting enemies. There are some issues with targeting enemies that move from left to right, but the AI seems to be programmed with the auto-aim in mind. They tend to move from cover to cover, which allows you to easily take them out when they pop out or stand still to shoot at you. You can opt to fine-tune your aim as well. Here you will stand still, and then you can shoot whatever part of the enemy's body that you want. This is really good for hitting snipers along with going for those headshots. You get a nice arsenal of weapons as well. You get to use different pistols, SMGs, rifles, a sniper, a rocket launcher, and more. When it comes to the sound effects and the impact, the guns are a bit of a mixed bag. The KP-7 has horrible spread, making it a subpar weapon that has bad accuracy. Some of the other assault rifles lack that punch that you would want from the shots. What do sound great are the pistols and the shotgun. The pistols have a nice punch to them, even with the silencers on, and the shotgun is the best of the bunch, with great sound, impact, and even some nice range to it. Enemies will bounce back or even flip over when you hit them. I do wish that the weapons were more consistent across the board with their sound and impact. Generally, most of the SMGs and assault rifles are on the weaker side of things, with other weapons like the sniper and shotgun helping to make up for it. Overall, the shooting still holds up with some minor hiccups like the auto-aim having trouble with enemies moving from left to right. And still, Agent Under Fire shooting provides a solid experience. Agent Under Fire provides a solid amount of different gadgets to use. You will be able to burn off locks with your laser, reach high areas with your claw, see hidden panels with your glasses, and much more. The claw is really fun to use, but it's very restrictive within the campaign and allows for more freedom in the multiplayer, which we'll get into a bit later. I do like seeing the fun gadgets take center stage at times showing off this element of Bond. When it comes to the campaign, this is much more of a linear roller coaster. This means that the experience is a bit more of an on-rails and direct experience but this also allows for a very fun, short and sweet campaign. The first level hits the ground running. Once you start the level, the game presents you with two avenues to enter the facility. If you choose to hack the main door, you will get a short cutscene, along with a door to an armory that requires a key. As you move throughout the level, you will get presented to some nice action bits and an introduction to some of the other gadgets. You get to play around with some different weapons, and then you get some nice explosions with a cutscene to bookend the level. If you choose to enter the level from up top, you get the drop on the first guard 
and you get to take him out easily. After completing this level twice, I still couldn't find the key card for the armory. So I tried a few more times and eventually figured out that if you sneak in from the roof and hit the guard rather than shoot him, he will drop a key card. And within the armory, you will find a hidden rocket launcher to use in the first level. Some of the levels have this minor amount of problem solving to them, and it's really satisfying to figure it out. Some of the levels do allow for some more choices in your approach. This does allow for some replay value because in these situations, you can change from stealth to action on the fly. Do not expect a large amount of freedom to the levels, but there is a decent amount in some situations. Along with this, the levels are built on a point system to provide you with unlocks. You are evaluated on different areas, and the most interesting of these are the Bond moments. This is where the player is rewarded with the Bond theme for doing something that James Bond would do, like using your gadgets in an interesting way, taking advantage of an opportunity, and other situations. These are pretty fun to do and find throughout the levels, along with helping to improve your score. Safety first, lads. Most of the action takes place in first-person levels. You will mostly fight different henchmen that come in three different forms. Normal gunmen, heavy soldiers, and grenadiers. There are some boss fights thrown in, but they are mostly just different forms of bullet-spongy enemies. Some parts of these fights can be pretty fun, like taking out a boss with a crane or using remote-controlled rockets to be able to take them out. The meat of the action is in the open combat sections or options for stealth. There's a nice mix of open combat stages, stealth-focused areas, and then levels that allow for different approaches. Sneaking around a facility using your gadgets and silently taking out the enemies is really fun. One level has you sneaking into an embassy and you cannot kill anyone. There's guards to take out along with laser alarms to watch out for. You can use your glasses to find invisible panels to expose the wires and then you can deactivate them with your own laser. Agent Under Fire never lets up and does a really good job of keeping the action fresh. While the shooting does take up the bulk of the levels, there are a few driving and rail shooting stages to provide more variety. The driving levels are very quick but a lot of fun. The cars handle well, the weapons are fun to use, and the action is very high. I just wish that these were either longer or that there were more of them. The first time you get behind a car, the level is way too short. It does have some really good parts, like being able to race around a small city and then going down into the subways. But the entire mission revolves around stopping a van and then the mission is over. If you are really good, you can complete this in two minutes. I just wish that there was a bit more before the van appeared. Like maybe fighting a bunch of henchmen that leads up to the bit with the van. This way you can get some more time with the car. The second car level is a bit longer, but you have less freedom than the first one as it's a more direct level and there's no city to drive in. Like I said, I have no issues with the controlling of the car nor the action within the level. I just wish that there were either more than two car levels or that they were a lot longer because they are so enjoyable. The rail shooting stages are enjoyable as well with lots of action and explosions. One of the rail shooting stages involves a tank and this was a nice nod to Goldeneye. There's not much choice when it comes to these stages, but you do get a few different weapons to use, like an assault rifle, shotgun, and a missile launcher. These are very direct levels with lots of in-your-face action. As you can see, the campaign has a solid amount of different stages and gameplay to try to keep things entertaining. I enjoyed every level within the game, but two of my favorites worth mentioning is one where you get to do some snooping. Here you are left in the main lobby, and you can opt to tackle this level from a quiet or a loud approach, with the option to switch to the louder approach if stealth fails. There's some nice avenues for stealth with the different vents that you can crawl in. Then I really enjoyed the second driving level. It is a bit longer than the first driving section, along with transitioning into a fun rail shooting stage while in a tank. Agent Under Fire excels at putting the player in Bond's shoes with a roller coaster experience. The campaign is rather short, but it does offer replay value through the scoring system. At first, the main goal is to achieve a gold ranking. This will usually unlock something for single player and then allow you to go for the platinum medal. When trying to obtain this, you will now need to grab some 007 icons within the levels for bonus points. The platinum medals provide you with unlocks for multiplayer. This helps to extend the game out quite a bit as you are trying to earn everything. So you have the gold unlocks for single player and the platinum for multiplayer. This adds a lot of replay value to the very brisk campaign. When it comes to the game's flaws, I only have a few. Some might see the game's length as a flaw due to how short it is, but the flip side is is that each of the missions are really good. There's a lot of variety and a good amount of reasons to return back to them to earn all the unlocks. On top of this, the multiplayer is a blast 
blast and still fun to play to this day. Like I said before, the boss fights are really not the best parts about the game. Some of the areas could use some better checkpoints as some deaths can cause you to repeat a few areas of the level. Some of the final missions are rather long compared to the other levels and this is where better checkpoints are needed. And then there are a few parts where the game explicitly tells you to use a gadget. I wish the game allowed the player to just problem solve it rather than having it handed to them. Outside of these minor things, the campaign is an awesome experience. Agent Under Fire is the second attempt by EA to tell an original Bond story, and this one is pretty fun. I don't know how to thank you. I'm sure we'll think of something. I'm afraid your interview with Ms. Malprave has been delayed. In the meantime, you can enjoy the view. I already am. The story here is enjoyable and does just enough to get some nice context to the action. Do not expect in-depth plots, villains, or character development. This is an enjoyable Bond story that focuses on putting Bond into different situations to benefit the gameplay. That being said, there are some nice moments within the campaign where Bond's personality shines. It is important to note that this isn't the most serious of plots. There's some silliness within the story that would fit right at home during the Moore era of Bond. Bond here is very on the nose, and there's even some nice bits of humor with some of the cutscenes, especially some from Q. Though I enjoyed the story, there are two notable weaknesses within it. One is how the mission briefings lack any sort of presentation. Most of the missions start out with information being delivered to the player, but they feel like a high school PowerPoint presentation. These sections needed more style, like the cutscenes. Along with this, the main villains are rather weak and not that memorable. They are mostly there to just stand in your way, but they lack anything that would make them memorable. The cutscenes are quick and enjoyable, with a fun story that is more concerned about getting the player to experience experience Bond rather than watching him do something interesting in the cutscenes. The multiplayer is another strong area of the game. The multiplayer provides a lot of different options to toy around with. You can choose which weapons you want to appear in the stage. With this, you can have everyone start out with the rocket launcher if you so choose. Then you can choose the different power-ups that you would like to see, like healing, cloak, and more. Along with other modifiers like no fall damage, low gravity, the speed of the game, and much more. And you can also enjoy the multiplayer with bots. The only downside with the bots is that they are not available in the PS2 version, but they are present on the GameCube and Xbox version. Versions. There is a wealth of customization here for the multiplayer, along with a good amount of maps. You can mix and match the many different settings to create some very fun custom matches. Then there's a few different modes as well, with deathmatch, protect the flag, disarming bombs, and then a mode where a player is the top player and everyone needs to hunt them down. The multiplayer even includes some weapons that are not found within the campaign, like the photon cannon and grenade launcher, along with some different mines. When it comes to the multiplayer action, it's still great to this day. It is essentially an arena shooter, with with Bond and it works very well. One thing that adds some really nice flavor to it is how you can equip everyone with a jetpack and the Q-Claw. The jetpack gives you a nice boost, but the best thing about the multiplayer is the Q-Claw. This allows you to attach on any surface and you can zip around the entire map. If you hold down the claw, you can stay where you are attached to it. So you can use this to find some nice vantage points to surprise your friends or the bots. I love how this is incorporated into the multiplayer and adds an element of verticality to the action. The maps generally provide enough space to use these items in as well. The multiplayer was not revolutionary or anything like that, but it's really well done. I had fond memories of playing this mode with friends and against the bots. I am glad this area of the game still holds up. Before we move to the conclusion, I want to praise the soundtrack. Each of the multiplayer levels feature unique tracks along with some very nice action beats that help to pump up the action, along with featuring that classic Bond theme. Here are a few tracks from the game.
Agent Under Fire is an underrated Bond game. While this was the first entry for the next-gen consoles at the time, I think this entry often gets overlooked by the many other Bond games released within that era. This was a golden era for Bond games as EA and their developers were continually knocking it out of the park, with the also underrated Nightfire, Everything or Nothing, and From Russia with Love. And Agent Under Fire started this excellent quadrilogy of games that provided wonderful experiences that excelled at providing quality games that respected the character. While Roger Moore was what the developers had in mind for their Bond, and even though he did not come back for this game, you can feel the influences of Moore's Bond all over it. Agent Under Fire's campaign is a roller coaster experience that pulls you in right from the start and keeps you engaged until the very end. Short and Sweet perfectly sums up the story mode. The action keeps changing from a first person shooting level with options for stealth and gadgets, and then to rail shooting stages and then driving sections that focus on big budget action. The story is rather light but still enjoyable, with an enjoyable portrayal of Bond. The unlocks in the multiplayer extends out the game's length and provides more avenues for replay. The multiplayer was one of my favorite aspects about this game when it originally came out and it still holds up. The use of the Q claw and the jetpack make it something special and unique for the arena multiplayer. When I think back on my personal favorite Bond games, I think back to this era and it all started with Agent Under Fire. Thank you very much for watching.